can do safe climbs, you can do scary climbs. Southern Arizona's land of legends is as mesmerizing from above as it is below. Parts of Kentucky transition from the cattle business to managing wildlife habitat. Now quail and songbirds are singing a happier tune. As much as 48 football fields a minute are being cleared around the world. From the wood basket of the world, a much healthier way to harvest trees. We think this could be some kind of long-term equilibrium. Long feared on the Yellowstone landscape, wolves are back, and so is a natural balance of predators and prey. So climb aboard and join us for a smooth landing, starting right now on This American Land. Funding for This American Land is provided by the Turner Foundation. Hi, and welcome to This American Land. I'm your host, Ed Arnett. We've got some great stories for you today about the conservation of America's natural resources, our landscapes, waters, wildlife, and the people that are dedicated to making conservation work for all of us. Today, we start off in Arizona in a rugged mountain range that provides a home for a major military base and for communities that value the lifestyle and the magical beauty in those mountains. The Dragoons are just some of the most impeccable granite domes that you're gonna find anywhere in southern Arizona. The seclusion of, of the climbs and, and the intricacy of the rock formations just make the experience just worthwhile. Well, this is Owl Rock. Uh, we're gonna be doing the route Night Stalker. This place attracts climbers from all over the country because of the varied nature of the climbing here. You can do safe climbs, you can do scary climbs. The folks that come here and are skilled climbers have adventures that are really, truly magnificent. When I came down here, I just fell in love with the place because it's so beautiful and so varied and rugged and it just has a really neat feel to it. One of the things I really appreciate about this area is that climbers have been taking care of this area for almost a half century now. Stewardship is a central characteristic among climbers at every one of them. When we talk about the public lands here in our area, you'll find that almost every group is, is completely on board that they play an important role in the vitality and in the economic development of our region. Have a nice day. The undeveloped lands here in the wide open spaces that we offer are crucial to the well-being of our county as well. It is what attracts people to Cochise County. The challenge becomes smart growth. We want to have growth in our area, but we want to make sure that we preserve what we have. Since 1877, Fort Huachuca has been a national treasure in the United States because of its topography, climate, and airspace. This area is surrounded by mountain ranges, which keeps the electromagnetic spectrum pristine for testing of communications devices. Fort Huachuca leadership really understands the balance of the environment and its missions and they work very hard on working with the communities to keep the environment the way it is today and in the future. Carson Caverns is a, is a demonstration of a, of a state investing in something that's, that's worth protecting. And I think it's a model of a lot of the resource protection that we can do uh, throughout the country, trying to find that balance of providing jobs and economic opportunities at the same time protecting the resource. And it supports the economies of most of Southern Arizona. There's a lot of living caves throughout the world, but this is a show cave, meaning the public can go through. Many show caves have been open for many, many years, so the cave isn't necessarily in the best shape. This cave, because it was developed in the 1990s, is in very, very good shape. The Whetstone Mountains are uh, one of the Sky Island mountain ranges in southeastern Arizona. We call them Sky Islands because they are islands of montane woodlands and uh, habitats in an otherwise sea of 
desert scrub, and grasslands. This is a living cave, so in other words, there's, there's actually water seeping down through the limestone and creating the stalactites and stalagmites here. And so rainfall, obviously, is critical to that. You know, people look at the cave on the outside. You know, a house down the street, what impact could it possibly have on the cave? But the house, eh, maybe not so much. The fact that they dip into the water supply, that's a big deal for us. As a live cave, one of the few live caves that's open in the world, it's imperative that we have a healthy water supply. We couldn't survive the impact of 20,000 homes sucking water out of the same aquifer that the cave currently uses. The country is beautiful, stunning, complex. It has an amazing variety of life. And once I learned about the importance of this area for wildlife in the entire North American continent, it's pretty hard not to be involved in working for its preservation. The challenge is that groups are working on identifying how important some of these areas are to various creatures and then trying to work with the agencies and with the public to get more people to understand and agree that it is worth protecting, that it's important. It's important to humans too. Well, I first visited the Dragoon Mountains nearly 40 years ago and when I I came here for the first time as a young rock climber. I felt like perhaps I was the first climber who'd ever been here with my friends. I am so grateful for the conservation efforts of local groups and the local climbing community, the Forest Service. I'm a huge proponent of completely preserving who you are and what you are. And this is, this is who we are. These are the lands that we have here. We've got the formations, we've got the amazing beauty, and we have all of these climbing areas that have already been established. And so people can come here and enjoy it and spend some time away from a lot of hustle and bustle in a really quiet and wonderful place. Now we have another story in our series of reports on the decline of the once common bobwhite quail. We again go east to Kentucky where millions of acres of cattle pastures have been converted from drought-resistant native grass to exotic varieties, causing disastrous loss of habitat for bobwhites and other wildlife. It's a good case study of what happened to bobwhite habitat and what can be done to restore it and see how cattle and quail can coexist in the east as they still do in South Texas rangelands. I move my cattle every day. I've got several different fields, and they rotate daily into fresh grass. Everybody thinks it's something new, but it's actually the way they did it in the 1800s. Uh, smaller fields give grass a chance to rest between grazings. Uh, I do what I think is best for the cattle and for the land so that I can keep doing it. I'm Brooks Spieler from Harrisburg, Kentucky, and I'm a rancher and farmer here in central Kentucky. Portions of Texas, including the South Texas brush country, there are still millions of acres of potentially suitable habitat for bobwhite quail. We're here an example of some really good quail habitat. We've got a good distribution of woody cover. We have a forbs, we have grassy cover, there's bare ground, all of the components that a quail need. People from all over the country will seek out hunting opportunities in places like South Texas, where cows and quail and native rangelands do very well side by side. In most of the eastern U.S., the native rangelands have been completely converted over to exotic forage grasses like fescue. And Kentucky is the epicenter of that. There's multiple problems with fescue as habitat for wild birds. But it doesn't provide much vertical structure for quail and grassland birds to hide in. Fescue also provides very poor food source. We are now realizing that there is opportunity to, to turn back the clocks somewhat and replace that fescue with the native grasses that were eradicated decades ago. And the place we're standing now is one of those locations, and the birds are responding to that. So there's, there's government incentives, 
Uh, there's also government technical assistance from the Department of Agriculture or from the state wildlife agencies that have trained experts that can come out and provide technical advice to landowners on the steps to restore the native vegetation. Those, those cattle that you just seen going into that native grass pasture was going into eastern gamma grass. Uh, it is uh, one of the most palatable warm season grasses there is. The word's already getting out. Um, neighbors are, are kindly implementing some of the practices. You know, we want our producers to be profitable, and that way they'll continue being good stewards of our land. But it, it's good for everything. It's good for the cattle, it's good for the environment, it's good for the wildlife. So why not do it? What you're seeing behind us is this is a pretty typical grazed pasture, predominantly fescue, tall fescue, a little bit of orchard grass, so heavily grazed. You'll see not a lot of cover uh, for quail, grass and songbirds, not a lot of good habitat there. You know, what we saw on the other farm, the Peebler farm, was really the exact opposite. Um, they've got a really strict rotational grazing regimen in place. They're allowing their grasses to get taller. Uh, it's providing some really good cover for wildlife. So it's really um, a stark difference between the two. Shaker Village is a nonprofit to set up to uh, continue the education about the Shaker way of life and their religion. They were a communal society. It got started here in Pleasant Hill in 1806 and lasted until 1910. The rock walls, the, the farming practices, everything they did was essentially built, built to last. Going along with the progressivism of the Shakers, we saw that traditional farming and cattle operation wasn't working for us. We uh, completely changed the landscape. We have uh, converted about 1,200 acres, converted to restore native prairie, so it's warm season grasses and wildflowers. So it's hard to go anywhere on the property and not hear, hear birds singing or hear quail whistling. We embarked on a very ambitious project here. You can have excellent wildlife benefits, and you can also have economic benefits as well. And so they've been very successful. And it doesn't matter if it's a small plot on a small farm or if it's a big commercial operation, we can always come out and find something that will be workable within that landowner's interest. Our ultimate goal is we want high quality habitat on the landscape so that wildlife can thrive and also that the customers are happy too. We did this project for songbirds, grassland songbirds and wildlife that were in need. It did exactly what the quail folks wanted it to do. This field here is exactly what we're looking for in relation to having bunch grasses and a mixture of forbs when we're making quail habitat. Uh, much different than what we see on the typical landscape. My job is to coordinate the actions uh, of our entire agency and partners to restore Bob White to the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And we've been doing that now for seven and eight years with some really good responses across the state. There's a lot of opportunity to integrate wildlife and agriculture. I think there's a lot of society that has a real interest in that happening. Restoration for quail and songbirds is a, is a very high priority in Kentucky. You know, quail represent really an American tradition, uh, rural economies, uh, a rural way of life, a rural hunting heritage. I'm Gregory Johnson, Commissioner for Kentucky Fish and Wildlife. And there's a lot of other wildlife species that benefit from that besides just Bob White quail. Uh, songbirds, uh, butterflies, and now there's a lot of emphasis nationwide on monarch butterflies. Uh, their habitat fits very well with quail. We're seeing a lot of our younger farmers now really embracing having a wildlife situation on their farm that they can intermix with either their grain operation or their cattle operation. People all of a sudden feel very connected to the landscape here. And once they understand the value to that and it, it touches their heart, then they, they care about what it looks like and, and what we can do and how can we make it better. And so that's a real big part of the conservation puzzle. You know, we all depend on forests to live. They filter the water we drink, the air we breathe, and nearly half of the world's species live in forests. Destruction of forests is a serious threat to many of those species and is a major source of carbon pollution. Forests in America are threatened by development and demand for wood products, but there is hope for the future of forests here. 
We go now to Arkansas to see how private landowners are managing their forests to supply a growing market for wood products that are sustainably managed to protect them for future generations. My first memory of being in the forest is when we would come to visit my grandmother. And she would take us out to just spend Sunday afternoon in the forest. My name is Stacy Locke. I'm the operations manager for my family's sustainable tree farming operation, Locke Wind Limited. This is one of the tree farms that we have, and it's also a historical cemetery. This is Andrew Hemphill's headstone, my great, great, great grandfather. And oh my goodness, he died on my birthday, November 22nd, 1872. I mean, I don't like to cut the trees down. I love, you know, standing underneath these trees and knowing that they're over the, you know, headstone of my great, great grandfather. Um, the honor and respect that I have for the forest. This is something that my family has done for generations. This is the original deed for this property, purchased in 1835 and it's signed by Martin Van Buren. When you cut down one of these trees, it has had so much put into it. Uh, I wanna make sure that the best thing is done with that tree when it is cut down. The US is the largest forest products producer in the world. And where we are here in the Southeast US is known as the wood basket of the world. My name is Linda Walker, and I'm the Director of Responsible Forestry and Trade for the World Wildlife Fund. Forests around the world are seriously under threat from illegal and unsustainable logging. As much as 48 football fields a minute are being cleared around the world, especially in places where there is the highest wildlife diversity. And so the reason that responsible forestry and a paper mill that sources fiber from responsibly managed forests in the U.S. is so important is that fiber is coming from a forest that is very well managed and not having the same impact that cutting down rainforests in Indonesia might be having on tigers. WWF really believes strongly that one of the best ways that we can accomplish our conservation mission is to collaborate with companies and landowners. Uh, the Forest Stewardship Council standard offers the best protections. About 20 years ago, WWF and some other organizations were there to help found the Forest Stewardship Council. And that's an independent nonprofit organization that has developed the most rigorous standards for responsible forest management around the globe. So those Forest Stewardship Council criteria are meant for protecting stream quality and wetlands and protecting habitat on the land. We have a wide variety of FSC certified um, paper, which is called Earth Choice. The companies that we work with understand the value of responsible forestry. They're interested in a sustainable supply for 10 and 20 years down the road. You have customers that are requesting responsible products and FSC certification is the gold standard. Less than 10% of U.S. consumers recognize the Forest Stewardship Council logo, but actually the FSC logo is available on more and more products that you can find every day. And so when you see that logo on this product, you can know that the forests where the wood and paper came from were managed in a way that protects the wildlife, that protects air quality, water quality, and all the other values that forests provide. Our trees are typically pine, but this is gonna be a really nice diversified stand. We, we actually are planting four different species of oak. There we go. I'm Donna Jansen. I'm a fourth generation tree farmer here in Southwest Arkansas. They're unpacking the trees. These are hardwood trees. They just look like twigs, and they'll have this done in no time. When my mother passed away, my sister and I became the tree farm. 
over the years, we would see forestry practices managed in a much more passive way, I think, than the way we're managing today. That means you want to make sure you have a diversity of different species, watching to make sure you don't have an infestation of some kind of a, a beetle or a fungus, that you're protecting you the wildlife. You have rabbits and even mice. Uh, you'll have the, uh, the hawks and the owls to come in and, and prey on them. So my goals for our tree farm align perfectly with the goals for FSC, and because of that, it, it was a very easy choice for me. This is my daddy, Jim Pratt. He and my mother worked really closely to manage our forests. I know you recognize that person. <laughs> yeah. That's Mama. When the men went off to war, how did that change things? Yeah, the ladies had to <clears throat> take up the slack. It's important to us as a family that we maintain the forests that are the legacy for our generations to come. We've been annihilating rainforests all over the, the world, and now FSC, I think, is helping us get on track to protect those resources and even make them stronger for a stronger future. If there were ever a candidate for a successful rebranding in the animal kingdom, the wolf would probably win hands down. For centuries, humans feared, hated, and nearly exterminated these predators. But science and conservation now seem to have changed many people's attitudes as they realize the critical role that wolves play in a balanced ecosystem. The living laboratory for this is Yellowstone National Park. Miles O'Brien explains the complexities in our Science Nation report. Yellowstone National Park, where the bison roam, the elk graze, and hot springs bubble to the surface. Loads as a threat and nuisance, the wolf population in Yellowstone was essentially wiped out by the mid-1920s. That changed in 1995, when the National Park Service reintroduced them here. So, 20 years on, how has the Yellowstone ecosystem responded to the return of the wolves? That's what brings Utah State University wildlife ecologist Dan McNulty to this dirt road near Yellowstone's fabled Roosevelt Arch. I see what you're saying. It's, it's just its ears are sticking. With support from the National Science Foundation and working in partnership with the National Park Service, McNulty and his team are hot on the trail of the wolves' primary prey, elk. We're interested in understanding how wolves are affecting the numbers of elk and how that changes over time. And then we're also interested in how wolves are affecting the behavior and the movement of elk. Today, more than 4,500 elk graze Yellowstone's northern range. That's down from a peak of about 18,000 before the wolf reintroduction. Just under 100 elk are outfitted with radio collars, all of them females. So they are the reproductively uh, key part of that population, and that's why we're focusing on them. I got four spikes, Dan, I don't know. McNulty and his team track them closely, especially those that have calves. It turns out that for much of her life, a female elk is actually highly unlikely to be killed by a wolf. Wolves tend to go for the easy pickings. Soon after an elk is born, roughly one year of age, they're highly vulnerable to wolf predation because they're small. They're easy for wolves to capture. Elk that are between around two and 10 years of age, female elk, are largely invulnerable, so they can survive attacks by wolves because they're aggressive. When a collar indicates an elk hasn't moved for a while, that's an indication she might be dead. McNulty or one of his Park Service colleagues always check it out. If a wolf killed her, they want to know. And we can investigate the area. If we find a dead elk and we find uh, enough evidence, we can determine cause of death. Biologists with the Wolf Project track the wolves using collars as well. They say that for now anyway, the wolf population in Yellowstone seems to be holding steady at roughly 100 animals or so. Since about 2008, our wolf numbers have been fairly flat, uh, stable. And so how long is that going to last? I think where we're at now is, is pretty much what we expected 20 years ago. 
And unless there's some kind of major change, of course, climate change is a huge wrench in everything. We think this could be some kind of long-term equilibrium. So there's all kinds of natural breaks on the predation process that prevents what we would refer to as runaway predation. Killing is a very dangerous, difficult activity for wolves. And that's a, a fairly underappreciated fact. Fuller understanding of what's happening here could translate to better predator management decisions all over the globe. Good thing scientists are keeping an eye on things. Miles O'Brien reporting. Now, here's a quick look at a story from our next show. It's a great place to ride. It's a great place to live. I really hope that my grandkids and great-grandkids and on into the future can have a taste, at least, of a lifestyle that's, that's very real and dramatic and um, beautiful and has a hard edge to it, but um, keeps, you, keeps you feeling alive. That's it for this week. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. For more information about this program, visit thisamericanland.org and like us on Facebook. Funding for This American Land is provided by the Turner Foundation.